But very quickly, both sides begin building better and better planes. And so these are some of the first shots when they started dropping bombs from the planes. Now this is an actual photograph. The pilot had taken a picture of his observer trying to drop a bomb. And these were really small, really inaccurate, didn't work very well. But by 19, by the end of 1917, that is a fleet of light American bombers just when they entered the war. That's a four-engine British bomber that could carry 4,000 pounds of bombs, 800 miles. And so that could go from bases in France, hit German cities and back. And this is a German propaganda poster warning of British bombers. And the big thing was they could drop bombs, but they could also drop gas. Gas did not work on the battlefront, but the plan was in 1919 to hit German cities in the west, all the big industrial cities with gas and the big industrial areas. Areas. The war ended before that could happen. But when the next war hit, at first they were reluctant to bomb cities, but by 1940, both sides were bombing cities, Germans especially at first, and then the Allies, the British and the Americans. It is unbelievable how much they bombed. And then Vietnam, all the way up today, bombing cities. It's just natural. Even though, even though bombs are more accurate today, it's still killing hundreds of civilians because civilians are where the fighting is. Yeah. That's gas. Everybody uses, like, they drop gas. Has they ever done that? Britain did it in 1919 when they were trying to subdue the new country they created called Iraq. Yeah. This would just keep spiraling. And the Italians use it in Ethiopia. The United States use it in Vietnam. Uh, not mustard gas, but different types of. Uh, uh, chemicals and Iraq used it against Iran. Yeah, U.S. and West Germany supply. It, it doesn't. It's not very effective, and, and there's still a reluctance to do it because of the word. If we do it, then the enemies will do it. Number four, genocide. Genocide. I'm not saying that they're yeah we can do genocide, but total war would be an excuse to get rid of. Now these are potential enemies. Potential enemies within their country. Potential enemies within. And that's the important thing. Now, genocide is not just killing of a group. It's industrialized. It's using the tools of the Industrial Revolution. I'm not saying that countries didn't try to eliminate different groups. People didn't do this. It's been happening for a thousand years. But the tools of industrialization, the Industrial Revolution, allowed it on a mass scale. So not just the weapons to kill people faster, but one of the big things was the transportation. With modern railroads, and there was a decent rail network where this happened, they could evacuate people to one common spot, to either have a concentration camp where they could kill or starve, or even worse. The first modern genocide would be here, and what they would target people based upon what? It could be race, what else could it be? Religion, any others? Yeah, it could be gender, it could be beliefs, it could be nationality. The reason I'm giving you that, it's something about them that is different than the majority population. There's something. And that something, what you have to get down is, makes them untrustworthy, a potential enemy with them. Something about them makes them untrustworthy. Now remember Total War, it cannot Countries cannot allow this set. But just imagine, here's a country fighting for its very survival, and there's a group of people that you don't trust. Might they revolt? Total war gives that justification, saying it's a wartime measure. We have to do it to save the country. And there's different degrees of this, getting rid of a suspect group. This would be the big one. What country is this? The Ottoman Empire. It's the Ottoman Empire. It will become Turkey after the war. Part of it will in Syria and Iraq and Israel. But here's the thing. Here, in 1915, there's a minority population in Western Turkey called, you can read it right here, the Armenians. And the Armenians, they're, they're Semitic, but they are Christians. And they lived in relative peace in the Ottoman Empire. But as the Ottoman Empire declined, they started blaming people and they scapegoated. You've heard the term scapegoat, haven't you? They scapegoated 
the Armenians. And then when war began, here are the Armenians. Here's Russia. Well, right here, part of the Russian Empire are also Armenians. And so Turkey could say, well, the Ottoman Empire could say, we can't trust the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire because they're allied with the Russians, because they're across the border. <clears throat> that is the country of Armenia today. It was part of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Empire. And so what they began to do was to concentrate, and these are the areas of concentration, Armenians. And then in the process, they took them by train, purposely starving them, took them to camp through the roots, where, where they would be starved, where they would be mowed down with the modern weapons, machine guns, or even, it's all horrific. We well, see these kind of big arrows here. They took hundreds of thousands of Armenian men, women, and children and forced marched them into the desert to die in the desert. And so they took them by rail to these spots. So the Industrial Revolution got these masses and then they forced them into the desert. Hundreds of thousands would die. And check out the years. 1915 to 1923. The war ended November 1918. Actually, Turkey was out in October 1918. Ottoman Empire, I'm sorry. Wow. That's five years after the war ended and the killing kept going. Total war, what do you want to do to your enemy? I mean, how do you want your people to feel towards the enemy? Hate. You can't shut off hate. It can't be all of a sudden the war's over, okay, everyone's happy. No. The hate and distrust continues. And it continued here in the destruction of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And so in 1923, they were not just killing Armenians, they were killing Greeks here. It was slaughter. After the war, in many ways, it would be just as bad. Same thing after World War II, just as bad as during the war, because the hate continues. <coughs> this picture right here, that's being led into the desert. These are Armenian men, women, and children that were shot. And I'm really glad this is black and white, because the, they're already beginning to to turn black and they're beginning to uh, <clears throat> putrefy and it's just a horrific picture. And everyone knew it, 1915, these are three headlines from the New York Times. 100 Armenians counted destroyed, millions of Armenians killed or in exile, till a horror is done in Armenia. That's back in 1915. This is one of the most macabre and I still can't figure it out. So this is, Arme these are Armenian survivors after the war. And for some reason, they posed them with, with the skulls of dead Armenians who died because of the genocide. I don't understand that. That's just weird. Weird is not strong enough of a word. We don't know how many Armenians were killed. Between 1.5 million and 3 million Armenians were killed. Now, me saying that, we are broadcasting this. We're broadcasting this. And so if someone from Turkey hears that, I might get a, a nasty email. Because to this day, Turkey does not acknowledge this happened. To this day. Turkey wants to join the European Union. And that's kind of on hold for a couple reasons. But the big reason they were not allowed in before the crash in 2008 was because Turkey would not admit this happened. To this day. And I know some people from Armenia. They're Armenian immigrants. Actually, they were in what's that? They're in Iran, and they fled during the Islamic Revolution in 1979. And, you know, this was a long time ago. And I was with a guy, his name was Armin, really nice guy. He said, or someone mentioned Turkey, the country Turkey. I don't even know how, like go to a Turkish restaurant or something. So I was in, in Los Angeles. And he got, I mean, that is not strong enough to term. You know, how dare you take me to that blank and black restaurant, right? And this was 2009. And so there's still really hard feelings because of this. The Germans were actually appalled, their German allies, by what the Turks were doing. That's one little bit of irony. 1938, Hitler was, um, he had been in power in Germany for just almost six years. And they were basically doing this a program of persecuting Jews to try to make the very small population of Jews, but still the population of Jews in Germany leave. This is where World War I started. And it was getting more and more extreme because everyone knew war is coming. This is the end of 1938. And he was asked, well, might you get more enemies by being this, by being this brutal to Jews? And Hitler responded, 1938, today, 
who remembers the Armenians? He made the assumption no one will care. What happened after the war? Anyone know what happened after World War II? Everyone tried to forget what happened. No one talked about it. You've heard of the Holocaust? No one talked about it outside of the very new country of Israel until the 1960s. There's a great museum in Washington, D.C. called the Holocaust Memorial. That was made out of guilt for not talking about it in the 1990s. So it's not like, oh, we knew this. No. People try to forget just like they forgot here. They, so, did they shoot them or did they those were shot. Those were shot. These people just let off the star. The, the brutal, and then thousands were starved within these camps, too. So, those are the rules for war. I gave you this because the United States is going to jump right into this thing. The United States is neutral, remember? And so we're jumping to the U.S. The U.S. will jump in with both feet in the total war. They don't hesitate. Well, let me rephrase that. They hesitated about three weeks. 1916, there's a presidential election. Woodrow Wilson's running against Charles Evans Hughes. Wilson's a Democrat, Hughes is a Republican. And Wilson's cry, well, this cartoon's actually mocking Wilson. What Wilson was, he kept us out of the war. That's what he kept us out of the war. He kept us out of the war. This one, War in Europe, Peace in America. Wilson's campaign was, under Wilson, we're not going to go fight a European war because pressure was building to go to war. Wilson kept us out. And so, with that, vocab. <coughs> Good. Okay, so Wilson would win a very close election. A very close election. A lot of people thought he would have lost if not for the fact that he could say he kept us out of the war. He's elected in November. Inauguration is on March 3rd, 1917. So he's president. And in those months, everything changed. A month after he's inaugurated, America's at war. That's how fast. Done by a president who pledged to stay out of the war. So let's quickly go to that. What happened was this. There are a number of reasons, and we'll give a little more detail to the first two. The first one is unrestricted submarine warfare. Germany adopted it. Germany literally rolled the dice. This is a propaganda poster for people to join the German Kriegsmarine uh, with their navy, U boats surrounding Britain. Back in 1916, just like what happened after the Lusitania, Germany pledged, in what's called the Sussex Pledge, to not. <coughs> Do unrestricted submarine warfare, 1916. You know, the Lusitania was sunk in 1915, they pulled back. 1916, they basically reaffirmed it. But in 1917, <coughs> Germany made this decision when they had two new, well, a new commanding general and a chief of staff. Paul von Hindenburg, a field marshal, and then a general, Eric von Ludendorff. Eric Ludendorff, I'm sorry. Those two had won victory after victory in the West and they were given command of the great German general staff. Hindenburg, a field marshal, does anyone know what the equivalent rank of the United States would be to field marshal? Five-star general. Five stars. There's no five-star generals in the US Army. There were some in World War II. Eisenhower, for example. The last five-star general died in 1980. Our highest rank is four. Field marshals like that next step up. Hindenburg was more than anything else a figurehead. Here they are talking to the Kaiser. But once they took over the army, Ludendorff's plan was this. Let's knock Britain out. Let's knock Britain out now. Knock them out. If we starve them to death as quickly as possible, they brought in almost all their submarines at the end of 1960. Reconditioned them and sent out over 100 submarines at one time to try to starve Britain immediately. Knowing that this could bring the United States into the war. This map shows the area that they called the war zone. 
And any submarines who entered this, I'm sorry, any ships would be sunk regardless of where they're from. They talked about an American safety line, but the German side that was unworkable. Navy ships entered that, they would be sunk, period, regardless of where they were from. They figured we're going to risk America during the war, but America really didn't have an army. It would take them a long time, and we could knock them out by then. It almost worked. It almost worked. Britain had a significant number of ships sunk, over 300,000 tons of shipping in February alone. By April, they were beginning to, have, beginning to have severe food shortages. Anybody know how Britain solved the problem of the submarines? It was a move they didn't want to do, and it cut down the sinking meat. They used to send all the ships individually, thinking there's a better chance for one ship to slip off. But the problem is, if you send out a bunch of ships at once, that's many more chances for a submarine to ha just happen to chance on a ship, they went to convoys. Instead of one ship at a time, like 40 ships in a convoy protected by boats. And you think, well, gosh, if a submarine hits his 40 ships, can't they sink a bunch at once? Think about how big the ocean is. There's almost as much chance for 40 ships to slip by as one ship to slip by, because the ocean is so vast. The number of ships being sunk was cut by 60% overnight. Something so simple. Anybody want to guess what they did in the beginning of World War II? Day one? Convoys. All right, so back to this. The U.S. was furious because American ships started being sunk. They broke off relations with Germany just about the same time Wilson was inaugurated for a second term. Uh, United States is mad. Now, Germany is thinking, wait a second. What if the U.S. does enter the war? Enter the war? What if they do? We better be ready. That leads to... This, oh, this is all propaganda. I almost forgot this. This U boat war would be great propaganda. This is American propaganda after the war. And this bloody hand, supposed to be the, Ger uh, the Germans under the water, killing innocent people. And even, even though the Lusitania was sunk two years earlier, it's still, everyone knew the ship, so it's in the US, Canada, and Germany. The Zimmerman note, though. The Zimmerman note. It's one of the dumbest <coughs> political moves in history. The Germans made a lot of stupid moves. Did you miss something, Christine? A bunch of really dumb moves. Remember the United States intervened in Mexico. That's where you read we did the quiz. They intervened in, if you look over here, Veracruz for a few months in 1914 during the Mexican Civil War. And then the U.S. chased after a Mexican revolutionary. We call them a bandit, bandit in northern Mexico. The U.S. kind of invaded. While this is going on, the U.S. is chasing him fruitlessly. Who was that revolutionary? Just hmm? no. going on, but he's Mexican. Hmm? It starts with Pancho Villa. It looks like Villa in speaking English, but it's Villa. Pan and so Mexico, we figured they're already mad at. So the German foreign minister sent a note. That's why it's named after him, the Zimmerman note. It's a telegram. And to get to the United, it had to go to the United States because that's where the underground cable went. And then it would go to Mexico City, the German embassy in, the Mex in Mexico City. It's written to the German ambassador in Mexico. And he would give, he would go talk to Mexico if the U.S. entered the war. They sent it in code. You see the code? It's just numbers. The Germans thought their code was unreadable, so they sent it out. And on Telegram, it actually, I know this sounds weird, but the way they sent the Telegram is, it, it's, you know, it's war. And so they went up to Denmark, which was neutral, to Norway, to England, then across to New York City, then this one. They figured the British could never read their code. The British broke their code in 1914. The Germans had no idea. Had no idea. So the British broke it. They knew mo about 90% of the codes that have figure it out. The irony of all this is the Germans did not think anyone could break our code. The same thing would happen. Yeah. So, why, so did they expect the Mexicans to break the code? Or? No, to the German embassy. The, the German embassy in Mexico City, they knew the code. World War II, same thing happened. 
the British wrote the German code. Yeah, there was, and uh, the actor, or there, it was nominated for Academy Award. They made like the first computer, basically. Was it? What was it called? I didn't see it. Something Park. Yeah, Benchley Park. Wasn't it? Eventually is where they did the code breaking. It's called the Enigma. Magic was the code name. Wasn't it with a nice name like something like that? <coughs> um, How about this? We'll figure it out. But it was not. I heard it's a good movie. I might be a good one to watch after the test. If it's good. It's got the guy who was uh, in. Um, he's in everything. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. The, Hobbit. the British one. Yeah. The British Sherlock Holmes. The Hobbit. All right. Yeah, I mean, who cares if he can act? He's got a cool name. <laughs> so, they broke the code. Britain broke it. And what the message said was they were going to try to get Mexico to attack the U.S. if the U.S. entered the war. And what would Mexico get from it? You can see it in this cartoon here. There's Germany, there's Mexico. In the Mexican before the Mexican War, exactly. It's so stupid that it hurts. Of course, Mexico can't. They're in the middle of the Civil War. They can't attack. They wouldn't attack. It'd be suicide for them. But not only that, the British broke the code and then sat on it. They waited. January, they got the code. They waited until what started happening in February and March. Knowing the British knew the Americans would be mad. What's going to start happening? And American ships getting sunk. The Americans are furious. And then they would say, they hand the translation. And look what else they did. That infuriated. More than anything else, those two reasons are the ones on the surface that would lead to the United States going to war. <coughs> now, think about this for a second. All right, jump the gun. We'll come back to this. Remember this idea. The United States is intervening here. <coughs> regardless of what it says in the Declaration of Independence, regardless of what it says, you know, the American ideal was this idea of letting countries decide their own fate. That's what the U.S. did. All men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, whether there's <coughs> rights from the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, you pursue to happen. Then it has the social contract. Governments are created. People give power to the government to protect rights. And according to the document that founded the United States, our most important American ideal, I'm giving you a hint for the DBQ, by the way. The most important ideal <laughs> that if government infringes upon those rights, what must the people do? Change the government, perhaps revolt. So here we are. Our founding idea is that government should protect rights. And this jumps right into the middle of it. The United States is intervening in a country to try to tell them, Mexico, what kind of government to have. Are we following that American ideal? It's arguable, isn't it? While this is going on, the U.S. had troops in Haiti, Cuba, and Nicaragua, too, because of big stick diplomacy. I'm leaning up to something. So, this is happening. And the president would ask for a declaration of war. He was reluctant, but then he felt he was very ideological, very idealistic, and just believed. He was the type of man who believed he was always on the side of the gods, always on the side of the angels, and knew what's best for people. Mm -hmm. President Wilson. Would you guys find out how long you've been held back? After the war, yeah. Yeah, but by then, it, it's done. Smart move by the British, wasn't it? And what Wilson, his declaration was not unrestricted sovereign warfare, was not the civil no. What he said is our duty, our duty of Americans is to make the world safe for democracy. In fact, that would be the cry. We'll make the world safe for democracy. Now remember, this is not a true democracy <coughs> to that context. What he means by this is letting people vote for their Republican leader, for a republic. Remember, the U.S. is a republic. 
But what you have to get down are two words. And this is going to come back again and again after this. Our American ideal from the Declaration of Independence would be, and this idea, therefore, of democracy that the U.S. wanted to spread would be called, write down, self-determination. It fits right with this. And what Wilson is arguing is that Germany has taken away countries' right to self-determination. We have to let countries decide their own government. So we're going to go to war to fight for their own government, and Wilson implied that, of course, everyone's going to choose a government like the United States, which we call a democracy. Sounds very noble, doesn't it? Sounds very, a well, little self-righteous, but sounds noble. Wait a second, did the U.S. believe that? <coughs> what was the U.S. doing in Latin America? Do you remember the Platt Amendment for Cuba? We were dictating the government that we wanted, not them. Where did the Americans colonize? What places? Hawaii, what's another one? Philippines. Guam. Puerto Rico. Do we really believe that? Is that our ideal? Why did we do that? Why did we not allow governments they wanted in those countries? Because we wanted what? Economic control. You think we need self-determination for the colonies of Africa? <coughs> Our allies have? Are we going to tell the British, you have to get rid of your colonies in Africa? Like, We're fighting for this. Go to hell. Really? That's actually what they said. Same deal. In Asia? You know that? You see how this is complex? <coughs> By the way, I took time to talk about this. Hint for DBQ. Big hint. Big hint. The DBQ is going to ask, did America, did America go to war, or by going to war, did it go against American values? I'm giving you big hints. But next, the next big one. <coughs> In Russia, there's a revolution. Not the Bolshevik yet, not the communists. And it looks like Russia is going to have a republic. And so the United States could argue, it happened just before the U.S. entered the war. We're now fighting for democracies. We gotta help this new Russian democracy survive. I'll get to that uh, revolution in a second, but it's pretty important. <laughs> Next, Belgium. Belgium. Do this now? <clears throat> I don't know you're looking at the question, but Belgium. Remember the poor little Belgium? This is an American poster. Basically the loan money to the government, that's a liberty loan. 1918. 1918, they're still talking about Belgium, and it's pretty darn graphic. I don't think you need like a script or something to tell you what this is implying with the German soldier and this young girl. I think every, you know what it's implying is going to happen. And so it's implying that this rape is going to happen to us unless we stop it. But then there's something else. Something <coughs> under the radar. Something they didn't put as a reason for war. Something nobody <coughs> talked about. Large American investment banks were buying up billions of dollars of British bonds. The British government <coughs> was desperate for money. In fact, right after the song, they sent representatives, representatives of the Bank of England to Wall Street to sell almost a billion dollars of bond in just one sale. And the interest rates were hot. So the bankers who were buying that could get a heck of a lot of money back. <coughs> we're talking interest of 7 or 8%, which is really high for a bond. Right now the interest is about 1.5% of an American bond. What's an American bond called given by the American government? I told you once before. Anybody remember? Nobody remembers? All right, this is what I'm going to do. I have a box full of bricks over there. I think you know what I'm applying. I'm going to make a wall. Treasury bills or key bills. Do you remember that now? If you don't, act like you do. Do you remember that now? There you go. That's how Americans do all money. It's the interest rates are so long off this. That's kind of weird. They're loaning money to Britain. What's the only way to ensure that those investment banks and these very wealthy people like J.P. Morgan are going to get their money back? 
Who has to win the war? Britain. Britain has to win. And so, the unrestricted submarine warfare, remember <coughs> what I said, it seemed to be working, and they panicked. And word was sent, the big bankers, the big money, it's even more today, the big money wants Britain. It's got to get into it. And then there's one more reason, write down industry. Write down industry. This thing talks about as a U.S. state neutral, look how much money the United States made. <clears throat> 1914, about a billion dollars total trade. By 1916, 3.2 billion dollars of goods. By 1916, were being traded to Britain. If the United States entered the war on the side of the Allies in 1917, what would happen to this number in 1917? <clears throat> if the U.S. entered the war on the side of the Allies, what would happen to this? Would it go down? The U.S. would trade to the Allies. Think about it for a second. If the U.S. is now an ally to them, what are the U.S. going to do? Trade with them more. It'll double. They knew it. Industry knew. The big industrialists. We go to war. We'll clean up. We will clean up. And you got to get that down. We will start shipping even more stuff. And we can charge top dollar. We will make even more money. $2.5 billion that bankers loaned to Britain. Almost always Britain by 1917. That number is going to go up by tenfold by 1918. To everybody. This is big. It will increase trade. We're thinking money. We get rich quick. Does that sound like the ideals of the Declaration of Independence? They didn't talk about this. Everybody knew in the 1930s, the Great Depression was raging, and it looked like Europe might go to war. Many people in the U.S. were determined, and they talked about this all the time. <laughs> To not let those banks, to not let those big industrialists get us into war again where hundreds of thousands may die. So they passed a series of laws to try to keep America out. Mm -hmm. Jeanette Rankin was the first woman elected to the United States, <coughs> to the United States House. Montana, you know, we mentioned this once before. She voted against World War I, a lot did for World War I. She would not win for re-election because of the war. She would win re-election again in 1940. For that basic idea, we're not going to let the banks get us into the war in 1940. So she'd be the only person to vote against the declaration of war against Japan and Germany. So on April 2nd, 1917, President Wilson would sign the law. It was not unanimous. And Wilson convinced himself that all America was behind them. But something really big was happening. And by the way, even though the Declaration of War didn't, you know, the number one thing is democracy, everybody knew. The ship's being sunk. Come on with the Zimmerman. No, we're the biggies. But I gave you the other ones that were really powerful under the radar. Now let me quickly do this, though. There was a Russian Revolution. It was happening while, right during Wilson's first month of his second term, and this would dramatically change the world. There are two of them. First one's the March Revolution. And the March Revolution, there are two big problems happening before we get to the March Revolution in Corinth. Two big problems. <coughs> the first big problem was, you know, Russia had been defeated in 1914, 1915. They tried a massive, titanic offensive <laughs> right here. Of Brusilov offense. They had a little bit of success in about two and a half months. But in that two and a half months, just two and a half months, they lost over one million men. Just the Russians. A million men right here. That was a catastrophe for Russia. And then they have been having food shortages all since the war began. 1916, that winter, was a nightmare. There were food riots and protests. And the food riots kept getting worse and worse combined with those casualty figures. And it literally exploded that March when the army was sent out in what's the capital of Russia? <coughs> Petersburg. Petersburg is a German name. That's a German word. So in the war, they called themselves Petrograd. The army was sent to put down the food, the, the people protesting for food. The army joined the protest. <coughs> The Tsar, who actually, 
he ran away from Petrograd, was at the front, right about here, near Minsk. He was told by his leading generals, in fact, it was his uncle, said, you've got to abdicate. It's done. The army won't back you up. And the Tsar abdicated. And what was created was a hybrid republic that we generically call the Kerensky Republic. Alexander Kerensky, there he is right there, was a leading member of it. He was the Minister of Defense, that's why he's in uniform. He would eventually come premier. And it was the Kerensky Republic that Wilson said is now we're fighting for democracy. But Kerensky made a fatal mistake. <coughs> he thought, we've got to stay in the war and win a victory. So he stayed in the war. Those are, those are troops in 1917. And the plan was that summer, the Russians, the British, the French, and the Italians would all do a big offensive together. Not only did they all fail, but the Russian troops, after about three weeks of attacking and horrendous casualties, the Russian army quit. And the Kerensky government began to collapse. Staying in the war was one of the dumber decisions. It ranks right above the Whitman Zimmerman note. And the government began to collapse. <coughs> And that's going to lead to, right down, the October Revolution. Oh, I thought I changed this. Oh, well. The October Revolution. Now, the October Revolution, they're on the old Gregorian calendar. Not the calendar. I'm sorry, the Julian calendar. I'm on the Gregorian. So they were actually a month behind. So the October Revolution actually happened in November. Whatever. Just go with October. And everyone calls it that, or the Bolshevik Revolution. The Bolshevik Revolution was a small group of communists. Remember we talked about, I give you a basic idea of a socialist. The more moderate socialist, then the more radical socialist. And the communists were socialists who believed that the only way for the workers to get control was through revolution. The leader of the Bolsheviks, last thing you're right today, is this guy, Lenin. Vladimir Lenin, who was in exile in Switzerland when the war began. We'll finish this Monday. The map is on Monday. If you have any questions on the document to go through it, I went through a lot of the reasons why the United States went into the war. And you remember, I, I really talked about this American ideal, the Declaration that it's independent, but what's something else? It's complex, I would argue. Have a good weekend. Right when you find work. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody. Now I get to watch a movie on the crash of 2008. It's actually really good. Really good.